First, if we think about the most creative, innovative places in the country, rural areas may not be at the top of our minds, but some new research finds that innovation and new ideas are finding homes in rural areas of the United States. Our next guest says Silicon Valley and other metropolitan areas don't have a monopoly when it comes to creativity and innovation. Richard Florida is a co-founder and editor-at-large of City Lab, senior editor at The Atlantic. He's a professor of business and creativity at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. His recent piece in City Lab is called The Rise of the Rural Creative Class. Richard, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Let's talk about this idea, first of all, that, okay, the innovation, the creativity uh, is coming from urban areas and not rural areas. Where does that come from? Well, you know, I think it's just a long-running myth. And, um, you know, we in urban affairs and in urban studies, or in, when people think about cities, you know, whether they read Jane Jacobs or not, the great late great urbanist, you know, they think of creative centers, they think of, you know, a Florence in Italy, or they think about London or Berlin in, in Europe, or they think New York City and this outpouring of art. Uh, big cities that were good like Chicago or Pittsburgh and Detroit in their day, or the San Francisco Bay Area in our time that were great at innovation or forming startup companies. And and I think in the in the popular mind, less so than the academic literature, in the popular mind, uh, innovation and all good things like that are associated with bigger, uh, larger, more populated, more economically robust, and more diverse cities. And uh, you've written a lot. And before we dig into rural areas, I want to get into a, a core concept of yours from your book, The Rise of the Creative Class, this association between innovation in an economic sense, in a business sense, and creativity in what we might think of as the more artistic sense, uh, performing areas, that kind of thing. Connect the dots for us. I think, know, I think uh, that in, Richard, in my I, words, you're, you're you kind know, of dropped. We're, we're losing Richard Florida now. We're going to uh, reconnect in another way. We're talking to Richard Florida, author of The Rise of the Creative Class, talking about rural communities and creativity. Uh, you can join in, by the way, at 800 642 1234. What's going on in your area when it comes to artistic creativity, performance, theater, art, music, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, and do you see that translating into business innovation, creativity in an economic sense? You can join us at 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234. You can email ideas at WPR.org. That's ideas at WPR.org. As we get Richard Florida back with us now, it looks like. Uh, Richard, uh, sorry about that. We lost you, but we've connected another way. Let's start that question again. Connect the dots for us between artistic creativity and innovation in an economic sense. Yeah, well, uh, sorry to listeners out there. This is the hazards of the Internet age. <laughs> Definitely. It make all of this uh, easier. Sometimes it makes it harder. Um, so, you know, um, when I was a, a younger person um, studying innovation, people said, well, innovation comes from R&D lab. It comes from scientists and techies. It comes from university research centers. And uh, the more I dug into this, uh, I could see that the places that were defining the centers of, of high-end, high-tech innovation in the U.S. economy, the San Francisco Bay Area, the New York's, the Boston's, the Seattle's, they weren't just high-tech centers. These were places with thriving music and artistic scenes. So we, we did some research and did some data analysis, which found pretty conclusively uh, that, that metropolitan areas, on balance, large, small, medium, you know, 350-plus metropolitan areas in the United States, on balance, the places that had the highest levels of innovation or startup companies or technological advance uh, tended to have all other things equal, you know, more thriving artistic music and design and creative economy. So I dubbed this group the creative class. It's, it's not just scientists and techies and entrepreneurs and innovators, but it's artists and musicians and designers. All told, about 40 million Americans occupy that class, uh, about a third of our workforce. Now bring that into a rural area or a small town that wouldn't have been on that list of 350 metropolitan areas. Does that connection still hold true? Well, even more so. And again, this is not my research. There is a group of people in the U.S. Department of Agriculture who are spec 
spectacular researchers. And um, 15 years ago, when Rise of the Creative Class came out, wanted to try to replicate these findings. So one thing they did was actually come up with a tighter and more robust definition of my own creative class using new data. But the other thing they did was try to figure out in rural communities uh, to what degree does this creative innovation economy connection hold. And what they found is, if anything, it's stronger. For one, they found, just like with the economy generally, innovation is not evenly spread across rural America, but just like it concentrates in urban America, in certain cities more than others, it is concentrated in certain rural areas more than others. They document about a hundred of what they call rural creative magnets across the United States. But the thing they find is in terms of whether you look at new product innovation or more, more continuous process innovation, the, the, the level of that at the rural in America, c- controlling for other factors like size, is about the same as in urban America. But moreover, this it, it, innovation and creativity in rural America is much more closely connected to arts and cultural creativity. In other words, to make this simple, in rural areas, if you have a thriving arts and cultural economy, the odds are even better than in urban America, you will have a highly innovative business economy. What is happening there? Why does that happen? Is it that, okay, if I'm a member of this creative class uh, in, a, you know, in the business side of things, I want to be in this area, whether it's urban or rural, where there's cool stuff going on? Well, well you know, there, there are several factors uh, which they find up the odds. One is if you have a great university uh, in, your, in your area or close by. Second is if, you're, if you have a close connection to a big metro, either, uh, you know, relatively close by air or even better if you're a rural area out in the periphery, like the Hudson River towns outside of New York, which have become hotbeds of creativity. Um, but but this, this arts and cultural connection was more important than any of those. Uh, if you have nonprofit arts organizations, if you have for-profit arts organizations, if you have art galleries, if you have working artists, and we know in America – as much as there have been urban artists, there have long been artists in America, in California, in New York, in Colorado, throughout our heartland, who have preferred to live in rural areas. So why? The, the most obvious explanation, and the explanation I have written about in urban areas, is that when you have a thriving arts and cultural community, yeah, like a Greenwich Village or San Francisco's Mission District or Haight-Ashbury area, we can go on. That attracts different, diverse, bizarre, strange, out-of-the-ordinary, weird people. And because those places attract out-of-the-ordinary, different-thinking, strange people, they have a climate that's open to different-thinking, strange, out-of-the-box entrepreneurs. So mine was a kind of a latency argument. There was a latent tendency in these places to be able to attract the artist and you know, the, 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 the musician uh, like Jimi Hendrix, the entrepreneur like Bill Gates, the musicians like the Grateful Dead and the San Francisco scene, uh, and the entrepreneur like Stephen Jobs. But what these researchers at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in particular a fellow named Tim Wojen, find, it's more direct that, that there is something in the rural communities that when they have a strong arts and creative community, it alters the way those communities think. It puts a premium on design-based thinking or on innovation-based thinking. It's not simply the indirect effect, the indirect effect of attracting talented and ambitious entrepreneurs. It's much more that the way of thought and the way of thinking and the way of doing businesses in those rural area changes, and that's what they conclude drives their higher level of innovation. But what I'm thinking is if I'm in uh, economic development, state level, county, local, whatever, what do I do with this? Can I do things to make my local rural area, my small town, more creative, or do I just have to hope we get lucky and the right uh, convergence of people just happens? Well, first of all, it says what not to do. So let's not pull up a dump truck full of money and give that dump truck full of billions of dollars to Foxconn or to Amazon HQ2. Let's not take that dump truck full of taxpayer money and, and give it to a new football or baseball or double A AA or triple A stadium or arena. 
what what it suggests is making very small bets in very sticky place specific assets. So uh, at the margin, natural amenities matter. Making sure that your bike trails and hiking trails and um, mountain biking trails are well groomed. If there are small arts organizations in your towns, helping to support them, perhaps by giving them a, a little bit of public money. Uh, a little bit of maybe uh, help, perhaps by helping them convene uh, benefits where they can raise more money uh, by supporting, even through local government, local musicians, giving them, giving them a place to play, letting them play at, at local events and charitable events or local government. It really means doing very small things that benefit your community instead of these big silver bullet approaches. And what these researchers show is support for small-scale arts organizations, support for small-scale musical organizations, support for the nonprofit community and the arts and cultural community. That is adding more value to the rural economy than it is to the urban. You would think just the opposite. Oh, my God, we're not going to have nonprofit arts organizations and art galleries and musical places in the rural community. No, that's city stuff. What this research shows is, is that is the stuff that really matters to the rural economy, and it's not big bucks. You know, so, so my, my view on all of this is stop wasting taxpayer money with the silver bullet, bullet solutions and the big bucks and, and do the small-scale stuff that matters. And by the way, that goes triple for state-level economic developers. For state-level economic developers who are the ones really loading up the proverbial dump truck with incentive dollars, really trying to give the big bucks to these big projects, what we call the elephant big game hunting, for them doing these small things throughout their states that matter – seem to have a much bigger payback. And, and you know what else? It's very interesting. It didn't only show that it paid off in terms of innovation. What's so interesting about this research coming out of the U.S. Department of Agriculture is that it showed in the communities that did that, people had a better feeling of well-being. They were happier in their town. They had higher levels of civic engagement. So it kind of made their town a better place for everybody, not just for the innovators and the companies that were, were – we're racking up these innovations and may, maybe by dint of it, a little higher profits and better wages for the workers. Richard Florida is with us, co-founder of City Lab, professor at the University of Toronto. We're talking about his recent piece called The Rise of the Rural Creative Class. You can join in at 800-642-1234. Do you see that uh, thriving local arts or music or other cultural scene in your uh, community, your rural area of the state, your small town. Do you wish you did, but you don't have it? What uh, What do you think your community, the state, should invest in to create this sort of hub of creativity? Call in at 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234. Or email ideas at WPR.org. We'll pick up the conversation coming up on Central Time. You're listening to Central Time. I'm Rob Ferrett. We're continuing our conversation with Richard Florida from City Lab, professor at the University of Toronto, talking about his piece on creativity in rural communities and the economic benefits of having a creative culture, an art scene, a music scene, whatever it might be. You can join in at 800 642 one, two, three, four. Have you watched a Wisconsin town, your own, or maybe one you visit, grow to be more creative? What signs of creativity have you seen in rural Wisconsin, maybe in your part of the state? Uh, do you think it is worthwhile to invest state money, local money, into uh, things like arts? Call in at 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234. Richard, wanted to ask you about uh, how the schools fit into this. Uh, do things like arts and music education play a role in what you're talking about? Well, I think so. It, it's unclear from, from this research that we were talking about, but I, I can give you a case um, that, that helps make the case. Um, in American popular music today, if you study this, and I'm a, I love popular music and I love popular culture, so I do, you will notice that among the great hit makers, um, there is a preponderance of Swedish surnames. Many of the great hit makers... I mean, writing hits not for indie bands, but for Taylor Swift and, or co-writing with Katy Perry and Lady Gaga are, are these hit makers from Sweden. Um, and then there's been New Yorker articles. There's been a book written about these fellas. Well, you know, in Sweden, 30 years ago, the Swedes had a massive program to expand art and particularly music education in their elementary 
uh, elementary and high schools. And it's no coincidence that as a result of that, many, many, you know, brilliant Swedish kids were trained in music and got the music bug. So, yeah, it, it makes great sense. And on another hand, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid who, believe this or not, folks, I always hated school. I always hated studying. <laughs> I never liked to go to school. I know that sounds odd for somebody with a Ph.D., I'm a guitar player. What did I like to do when I was a kid? Play rock and roll with my brother with a drummer and play in a band. I still, to this day, feel more comfortable in a music shop or playing with a guitar than I do in a bookshop or a library. <laughs> it, it, you know, Bill Clinton said this. You know, he, he realized at 17 uh, that he wasn't going to be the next second coming of John Coltrane. I realized about the same age I was going to be the second coming of Jimi Hendrix. But the point is that music stokes the passion of so many young kids that are bored by other stuff. And, and, you know, not just in urban areas or in working class towns like I grew up, but in rural areas all across this country. So, one, I think there's a direct connection. You know, arts and music education, they're big industries. You can go on and do well in them. But, two, I think there's an indirect connection. It stokes your passion. It makes you interested in stuff. It it keeps you going on the good path. And it, it gives you some skills, you know, for me. It gave me public, whatever, public speaking or public engagement skills that I wouldn't have otherwise had unless I was in a band. I want to bring on a caller. Uh, Nate is with us in Mesa Maney. Nate, hi. Yeah, hi. I just want to reinforce what the uh, uh, speaker is saying, um, uh, because I've lived in the Mesa Maney, which is a community of 1,600 people. for uh, It's grown gradually over the 47 years I've lived there. Uh, But it's been a community that's had... uh, uh, a civic pride and a uh, commitment to uh, engagement in the arts. Uh, from uh, they've had their own drama company. Uh, a, a music uh, local music group has emerged in the last decade. Uh, the community community provided uh, has a lot of public space, buildings, and. Uh, has provided a place for that music group to perform once a month. They also have a lot of parks that have been developed by uh, the Lions Club, and uh, I helped uh, clean the creek with a bunch of volunteers <clears throat> from the community and with a little money from the village. Uh, we also have some nice trails that have been developed. Nate, I'm going to jump in uh, before we run out of time, but Richard, he's hitting a lot of the notes. It seems like uh, Nate's happy with these changes. Community provided space for performances, maintaining those trails and natural areas. Uh, Mesa Maney doing a lot of what you're talking about, it sounds like. It, it, it sounds like the our article and the research that I wrote about it in Microcosm. I mean, they're doing what the people at the USDA says works across Thousands of communities. And one other thing, you know, you had mentioned local and state economic development. Nate said something powerful. It's not just city and state. It's local public-private partnership and local civic organizations and local community people and nonprofits. So I think we also have to rethink when we say economic development. It's the Lions Club. It's the local civic organization. It's local arts group. It's citizens. It's, it's a business, and you know, helping out with space uh, when it's not occupied. I think that's what's really been key to the turnaround in, in America, where, where that happens, where that local civic culture is ignited around arts and other things. That's where you begin to see success. Thanks for that call, Nate. Richard, in our last couple of minutes, a, a concern we hear a lot in Wisconsin, especially the smaller communities, rural communities, is how do we keep our kids here? How do we keep them from moving away? In our last minute uh, and a half or so, is uh, that part of the puzzle, too? Well, I think kids are going to move away, and I think they're going to move away to go to great colleges, and they're going to move away to those big labor markets, whether that's Milwaukee or whether that's Chicago, for that first job. But the question is, you know, those cities have gotten so expensive, and in many ways so common. I don't want to call them generic, but you know what I'm saying. And when people get older and they're going to raise their kids, they're looking for something real. The other thing we did not talk about is the research that's coming out Rural areas are not just better places to raise kids because they're safe and the kids feel more at home and they can play outside. We're finding that in terms of upward mobility, rural places actually, in many cases, offer a better pathway to upward mobility over time. So let the kids go away. Let them go off to college and get that first job. But when they get a little older, uh, make it an attractive place not only for them to come back, but for lots of kids from other towns to come and make a place uh, in a smaller town or a rural area. We'll leave it there. Richard, thanks a lot for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being with you. Thanks for having me.
I've been talking to Richard Florida, co-founder and editor-at-large of City Lab, senior editor at The Atlantic. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's known for his work uh, and his books about the creative class. We've been talking about his recent piece in City Lab called The Rise of the Rural Creative Class. Still time for you to weigh in maybe on what's going on in your community. You can email ideas at WPR.org or tweet us at Central Time WPR. Is there a local uh, effort, a local uh, theater group, something like that, a new thing going on in your town, in your part of the state that you want to give a shout out to? Tweet us at Central Time WPR. You can also send us a message uh, on the Ideas Network Facebook page. Is the creative community rising in your rural part of the state, your small town? Let us know.